Thanks for coming to the Postgres conference. So um, the first speaker we have today uh, is going to talk about using Puppet to manage your Postgres deployments. Uh, this is very near to me, so I, I wish I knew about this beforehand so, uh, and cause all the pain. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. So Chris will talk about Puppet and Postgres. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as uh, Sai mentioned, my name is Chris Everest, uh, and I'm here to talk about managing PostgreSQL with Puppet. Um, I'm really excited to be here. We, um, we selfishly put this Puppet module together to help us with our jobs, and um, it's kind of like our uh, one-click way of deploying Postgres. Um, and we're fortunate enough that we were able to kind of release this open source and give this tool to everyone else. So um, just to kind of get started and give me a little bit of a gauge of the audience. Can, can, uh, can I get a show of hands of who uses Puppet at all? Okay, so we got a few people. Anyone else using Chef or Ansible or anything like that? Okay, all right, great. That's, that's so like everyone kind of knows what we're gonna be talking about here as far as configuration management. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm from, well, I didn't say this yet, but I'm from Cover My Meds. I'm a systems engineer, and um, I work with all kinds of OS level stuff, application stuff, and um, I'm more of a sysadmin than I am a DBA, uh, but I have very smart DBAs that work with me that help us put the require requirements together for this, uh, this tool and this presentation. So uh, some resources here. We are hiring right now for a DBA. If you find yourself in the uh, Columbus, Ohio area, where uh, we would love to have a Postgres professional, another one on our staff. Um, Scriptscribe.org is a blog that our company maintains for technical blogs and uh, things like that. So if you're interested in any of the stuff I have to say, come and visit us. And also, uh, you can find um, all of our GitHub resources at the Cover My Meds organization. So, um, and down here at the at the bottom left of the screen. If you want to follow along on the presentation, we have some code snippets and things like that so that you can sort of uh, browse around yourself on the presentation. Uh, so Cover My Meds, we are a, we are a very unique organization that in, in short provides uh, ease of use for patients to get prescriptions authorized. Um, most people don't know about this, but there's this, uh, if you've ever had any sort of um, complicated health problems or a very expensive drug, sometimes it's really hard to get your prescription. So our company enables uh, electronic submission for prior authorizations. Um, and my, my goal is not necessarily to give you the spiel about my company, but um, we have a really cool company and everything we do we try to open source. So um, not only are we helping open source community, but we're also helping people with their health and um, that makes us all very happy. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. So um, just an overview of what we're gonna go through here. I'm gonna give you an idea of why we needed this puppet management for Postgres, give you an idea of like what our environments look like, and, um, and then step through kind of our puppet module. So um, as of right now, uh, it's funny, I wrote this presentation about a little over a month ago, and I've been working on it, you know, over the past month, just fine-tuning it. But um, a month ago, we considered ourselves a service-oriented architecture, and then somehow in the past month, we've started talking about a microservices architecture. So um, that's a little scary. But um, if you don't know what this is, I mean, it's kind of a big buzzword now, but it basically means lots of, lots of services that do very specific things. Um, and are all sort of separate and work together to make like one entire service or platform, if you will. Um, and what that means for us is tons of applications. Um, I'll go through that, those counts and give you a little bit of an idea of our environment a little bit later. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now is we're migrating from SQL Server to Postgres. So are there any SQL Server users in here? One, all right, good. Hopefully next year there will be zero SQL Server users in here. We'll be off of it and you'll be off of it. Um, the, just one more point about the SQL Server. We have, um, 
one gigantic SQL Server, which is sort of a legacy institution from when the company started about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And the, the um, organization, as far as how we have everything laid out, the service-oriented architecture, or now we're going to be the microservices uh, architecture, is causing us to go from this one big giant SQL Server database to tons and tons of little tiny Postgres databases. So that's scary to us. We have two DBAs and four or five sysadmins. So we have way more, way more databases than we have people to even figure out how to do it. Um, and then finally, take all that, we have, um, take all that, lots of databases, lots of apps, and we also have lots and lots of uh, environments. So we have um, a development environment for every developer, we have test environments for test engineers, and we have integration environments for customers so that they can go to and get their own environment and do integration testing with their own applications. And finally, these things all have to change at a moment's notice when code changes, when schemas change, <clears throat> excuse me, all kinds of stuff like that. So um, production. We have 50, about 50 applications. I wrote this a month ago. We probably have 55 applications this month. We constantly are deploying brand new applications. We have eight production databases. I would say we probably have 10 production databases since I wrote this. So we're moving quickly. Our integration environment, we currently have three. Multiply that by the number of apps, by the number of databases, and you can see how things grow very, very quickly. And then finally, testing and development, it just gets way out of control. Um, does anybody here use Vagrant? Okay, so um, we also use our Puppet, we use the same Puppet configuration in production and all these other environments that we also, and we also use that in Vagrant, so we get to sort of test this path to production through all of our apps, all of our databases and everything, um, starting with uh, this, these giant numbers here are correlating to all the Vagrants. Every developer gets their own Vagrant. Um, some of them have multiples, depending on feature branches that they might be working on. <clears throat> Excuse me, in their code. Which this is our uh, our battle cry on the sysadmin side. It's like you know the Oprah bees meme. You know everybody gets a database. Um, so I, I'm not much of a comedian, but uh, I had to put that up there to like honor the team. So um, right, so the folks who are using Puppet are you using the Puppet Postgres module. Anyone? No. Okay. All right, well, that's, that's cool. Then I'm, I'm not going to like, I can say whatever I want, and no one will even know what I'm talking about. I can lie all I want to. I'm not going to do that, I promise. Um, so Puppet Labs, for those of you who don't know Puppet, is the vendor that basically maintains Puppet. Um, they have the best Puppet modules on GitHub. They open source everything they do. Um, and their Postgres module is one that they consume themselves because Puppet itself uses Postgres as a data backend. So they have a really great Postgres module. Um, and so you don't really have to be afraid of the Puppet module that Puppet Labs releases because it's as easy as this one line to create a Puppet server. So um, barring all the complexity behind setting up Puppet, as Valentine said, there is a almost, almost a one-click way to deploy Postgres. So this will install all the official PGDG Postgres repos if you have um, a Debian-based system or a Red Hat-based system. Um, it installs uh, a PG data directory for the version of Postgres you're running. It supports multiple versions of Postgres running on the same machine. Um, it starts up the database server with a Postgres database, kind of like you would if you were just installing it yourself, but you just need that one line. And another couple lines, and you can have a custom database with a user and uh, grant all on your databases. So um, what's wrong with that? Not every database you create, you want to give someone grant all to. So I can't complain, though, because this is pretty awesome, super easy to do. If you're developing, yeah, you probably do want grant all in your databases. 
Uh, you can go one step further, create specific roles, Postgres roles, um, and apply very granular grants. Again, this details um, grant all for the role of app user to the database cover my meds. And yeah, great, it's totally easy. But what happens when you have to have 50 more application roles and you don't wanna give grant all to all the users that you create in your database? There's lots of work to do. And this is exactly where we started making this puppet module. Um, uh, we spent probably a good month just figuring out what we needed to do, and then we spent probably two months not doing anything and just saying, yeah, I think, I think we could do it this way, but that won't work. And um, We noodled over a long period of time, and then finally we spent another month uh, sitting down and hacking through all this stuff and getting it working for us. Um, and, and it's definitely a success story, otherwise we wouldn't have presented to come and talk to you. Um, so uh, the cool thing about the Puppet Labs module is that those you know, 10, 15 lines that I showed you earlier are super awesome, but there's way more stuff in the module that make it very, very flexible. Um, you have to break down all the things you need to do, like create app users, create databases, um, figure out what kind of grants you want to give your, your users or roles in Postgres speak, um, and have extreme patience and understand how the, uh, the Puppet architecture works so that you can make Postgres work for you. Um, and the secret to all that, um, everyone knows the PSQL command. There is a Postgres underscore PSQL resource in Puppet that allows you to do anything <coughs> that the PSQL command can do on the command line. So um, you have to give it a unique name to identify it because you, in Puppet, um, it, by the way, if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna glaze over a lot of Puppet specific stuff, but feel free if I've glazed over something that didn't make sense to raise your hand, I'll be more than happy to dive in deeper. Um, give it a unique, unique name, give it the command that you wanna run, the database you wanna run it on, and a unless statement, which is very important, that says don't do this unless this already satisfies a condition. And that's to make sure that your puppet things don't act over and over and over again. Once you have a user, for example, you don't need to recreate that user five minutes later, 10 minutes later, 10 years later. And then finally, you require the Postgres server, um, which we built in the very first step. Um, so Hiera data is another very, very important concept of what we're doing here. Um, so I'm gonna talk quickly about higher data. It's a YAML-based configuration file format that allows hierarchical organization of your data. So you can, you can have a very baseline set of data configuration, um, in which case, um, and I'll explain some examples as we go forward, but in which case your baseline config goes to everything or you can override at a per environment level, so maybe you have specific production configs that only, only go on production servers, or host specific configs that only go on hosts. And higher data will allow you to organize that hierarchy and then pick and choose, Puppet will pick and choose which configs, which environments or servers or all servers get. So we, we, uh, we have a really strong, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say we have a dependence on it, but it makes what we're doing a lot easier with this Puppet module. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through the higher data portion of it as we go through here. Um, and there's two important higher data structures that we use. One is a database server to application mapping. So the, uh, this is, you know, in, in uh, human speak is which applications are gonna talk to which database servers or which databases. Um, and then the second layer of Hiera data that we use is an application to DB role mapping. So in human speak, this is which Postgres role is the application gonna to use to connect to a database. Um, the, the reason we split these up, um, hopefully will become a little bit more clear, but we wanted to be able to detach these two configuration aspects from one another and we wanted to have the database server only really know about the databases on it, 
And then we wanted to have the application roles only know about the applications and the databases. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I kind of went through this, but the first one, define this at the host level. So our list of apps that are talking to a database or a database server will be defined at the host level. So our, um, in this case, uh, using Hiera data, our, um, our, we have a database cluster named cluster one, and in that host level of hierarchy for our config, we define the number, or the, not the number, we define all the applications that are gonna talk to it. And this is an example of that data structure. So, so at the top here is, uh, is a YAML format. So uh, CMMPGSQL is the name of our puppet module, and DB list is signifying that this is our list of databases, and they belong to cluster one. And my database is a database, and these are all the apps that are gonna connect to it. So at that point, all that host needs to know is what apps do I need to, what apps do I need to worry about. The second stanza down here is the equivalent data structure that is yielded inside a puppet. So if you uh, sort of were debugging and looked at that data structure, that's what it would look like. It's a hash. It's a hash of arrays. Um, and then the second data structure I talked about was the list of roles. So these are the list of Postgres roles, i.e. users, that are going to connect to your database. And these are at the baseline config. So across anything in your environment, um, so everything in production, the user, application user and password, and the database that it connects to is gonna be available to anything in our app, any application, any database, anything at all. And then here's an example of what that data structure looks like. Um, and this is probably chicken scratch to a lot of you, but we have a very detailed readme that kind of ties all this together on our GitHub uh, repo. So if anybody wants to go out and uh, reference that later, it's, a, it's pretty good. Um, so this is our second application to role mapping. Um, now this is an app specific variable, so the namespace is application, and we're saying that this is a DB config portion of the app config and then uh, the application name, so we know which application it belongs to. And then it gets a list of databases, and it gets a right handle in this case, which gets a, um, a default right role, which we'll talk about that later. That's not a Postgres role. This is an abstract data structure here. This is a what kind of permissions role do you get on the database. This is the host that it's talking to, the database, adapter, username, password. I mean, that stuff's pretty straightforward. Um, and again, what this data structure looks like translated into Puppet, it's a hash of hashes three, uh, three levels deep. Um, and the advantage to both of these data structures is that you can expand them infinitely. So you could have 100 databases on a cluster, you could have 100 users talking to a specific database. Um, and then a really important part of this uh, the right handle, notice this, we put this third layer in here so that we could define different types of application handles for all of our apps. So we can, we can point an application at a, a write database, in this case like a master, or a read-only database where we wanted to do like really quick uh, read operations. Um, that's a whole nother topic on the application side, but it's something that we wanted to make sure that we could support going forward. Um, and now we're gonna go through, um, I kind of gave you the high level, we're gonna go through the Puppet module as we built it. Um, so you can go on to github.com, cover my meds organization, and go to cmm underscore pgsql. And I noticed this morning that we should have probably named this puppet dash cmm pgsql to comply with Puppet stuff, but uh, we'll do that some other time and we'll break everyone's Git repos when they check it out. Um, so now I'm gonna get really deep into the puppet of what's going on. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, so init PP is like the base manifest. Um, manifests are cons considered your source, your source files for puppet. Um, init PP would be like the index.html of a web page. It's the first thing that puppet looks for when it's, 
when it's when it's going to operate on something. It uh, um, the R init PP kind of does like a a quick little setup. It calls out a few other manifests, and we're going to go through those. And then it also checks to see if the database host is a master or if it's um, a slave or if it's in the middle of a failover. So if it's in the middle of a failover, it does absolutely nothing. Nothing. It exits and says something bad's going on. I'm not screwing. I'm screwing with the database. If it's a slave, it does nothing because replication is going to handle everything on the slave. Um, and the advantage there is you can create one cluster, spin up your slaves, run a quick uh, run a quick script to initialize replication, and you can scale out. Uh, Numbers of, data, numbers of hosts in your cluster very easily. Um, so the next thing that's sort of still on the baseline, uh, we do a, we, the init PP calls setup PP, and setup PP does some very, um, again, baseline things, um, sets up PG top, PG repack utilities that we want to have on every database. Um, it installs some monitors for that database, which get exported to our Shinken Shinken slash Nagio system. So every database we spin up automatically gets monitored. And it, like I said earlier, it manages, um, it does things for masters or doesn't do things for slaves. Whoops. Um, oh, that's not a whoops. We are going to talk about higher data again. Um, so in setup PP, we we leverage higher data a little bit more, and we manage all of our Postgres config. So your PostgresQL.conf file. Um, and then we can, again, use our hierarchies based on host level, cluster level, environment level, or baseline level, or if it's even a developer machine running Postgres, we can apply this config. So this is another higher data YAML structure. Again, it's referencing CMM PGSQL. And, and this key, we're doing config, so we know how to get to it. Um, and anything that is valid in a Postgres dot, PostgresQL.com file is valid in here. This is a array of key values, or array of hashes, actually. Um, so anything you can think of, this is kind of just like a one for one. Stick it in there, and your, uh, your Postgres. Uh, well, one of the pitfalls of this, yeah, go ahead. What would you put in besides the value? Could you just say hot standby on? Or is there something else that would go in there, like that description? Uh, value actually, um, so you know, you bring up a good point. I probably should have showed the, uh, I should have showed the other end of this that calls the config. But value is a parameter in, a, in one of the Puppet Labs resources. So there's a Puppet Labs resource called PostgreSQL colon colon config and the parameter is value. So uh, the name of the resource, it would be um, hot standby, and then the parameter is actually called value, and then you have to give a value to it. So that's actually a built-in. But if um, it probably would be better to show that part of it, it would make more sense. Um, so next, if we're a master, um, we set up some very important things, like basically everything that our cluster is going to do. Um, we create an administrative user for our sysadmins to use so that we don't operate on the database as the Postgres user. Um, we use that for taking backups um, and handling schema change deployments, things like that. Um, we uh, create the de default permissions on the public schema, um, and then we revoke create by default so that any app uh, Postgres roles that we put in there don't get dangerous access to our database cluster. Um, and then at this point, we look up the CMM PGSQL, PGSQL DB list config that I talked about earlier, which is our database server to app list mapping. And once we have that app list mapping, we invoke that entire data structure, which is a database and a list of apps that connect to it. And um, it will create a database for each one of those applications. Now, at this point, all we're doing is creating a database. And in the step earlier, we did some, 
some uh, safe things to the default schema, the default public schema, so that bad things don't happen. Um, this, uh, this is actually a little bit hard to read now that I'm seeing it up here, but um, the app DB right here, this is basically what, what gets called. So app DB, this is the name of our database, and then these are all the apps that we'll be connecting to that database. And next, we, um, we create a DB handle, which is utilizing, um, this is utilizing our list of apps and mapping it to the handles that we talked about in the second data structure. So we basically created all of our databases and then, then uh, Puppet says, okay, I got my database, what apps need to connect to it? We go through our list of apps and we create all of our uh, database handles. Let's see if I can get back over to that. Yeah, so in this case, um, this is the structure that's creating the database handle. And then finally, the app user um, is created after the handle is created, which allows us to manage very granular grants based on templating. So um, we have um, a few, we, I mean, I think we have three or four templates right now because for the most part, an application gets pretty standard access. Um, we have a default write template, and we have a default read template, and we have a DB owner template. Um, but the cool thing about this is we're going back and using the, um, the PSQL resource I talked about earlier which is kind of like running PSQL on the command line, but you're not running it on the command line and you don't have to care about remembering what command you run or ran. Um, so this is, uh, I wanna stop and talk about this because we've, we've kind of went through all this data, which I'm sure everyone's kind of like swimming in their heads, not really sure what's going on. But in essence, what we're doing is we're running PSQL and we're generating a list of grants based on a template. We'll look at the template in a second. Uh, we're acting on the database that was initially in our list of databases running on the Postgres server. We're running as our uh, Postgres user and group at this point. Um, the path is not a big deal, but it makes sure that you don't run it on the wrong instance of your Postgres server. And then this unless statement. So we'll go, we'll go look at the template, but this unless statement is kind of the bread and butter, and we probably spent, I don't even know how many hours discussing how we were gonna manage this on less statement. Because there's two ways of doing it. We chose the easy way, and hopefully one day we'll go back and do it the hard way and the right way. But the unless statement says, if this user has a default ACL of read-only access on this database, here's the username, and here's the database. If this user has read-only, default ACL read-only access on this database, don't do anything. We assume what we've done, our template has already been initiated. Now, well, we'll talk about the pitfall of that a little bit later, but it works really awesome because you run your grants once and only once and you don't have to worry about it ever again. Yeah? What's that? It does a select, uh, so um, if you go look at the uh, PSQL resource type, if you look at Puppet Lab source code, they're running a select one on that subquery. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it, ret yeah, if it returns anything um, that's like, tr I mean, kind of like thinking like if it returns true. In this case, it returns a record, something, and it says, okay, this, this happened. I'm, Yeah, yeah, exactly. You want to make sure that what you're checking, though, is somewhat indicative of what you're trying to do. Because if you do it... As long as the where clause is satisfied. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then I talked about the... So uh, at the top here, you can see that in the command parameter, there's a template. 
and then here's how we design our templates. Um, I did some line breaks on here. I don't think that would necessarily work in real life. Um, but it's going to run all of these grants with that username on that database. So uh, this right here is our default write grant template. So pretty much every application that connects to one of our app databases gets at least one user that has a default write permission. So they can pretty much do anything except create tables. Um, they can't delete tables, they can't alter tables because they're not owners of the database. In this case, the Postgres user is owner of the database. Um, but then we have another template that is read-only, so we, we can restrict the grants a little bit. Um, and then, like I said, we, we have a DB owner, which would create that user as an owner and give it owner access to the database. Um, and uh, so, like we were talking about with the, the unless statement, the way we're doing it, and we'll go back up here, we're only checking, we're only checking if the user got default ACL access of read, which is kind of dangerous because, um, you know, a sys, sysadmin, sysadmin could go in there or anyone with administrative access and change grants, and we don't really have a way to protect against that. Um, but at the same time, we figured we're restricting all the other access to the database, and we have to trust our team to, like, do the right thing. And if, um, say, you're giving a grant to a specific role, then, and you know it needs it, the proper way to do it would be to um, record that in a template and make sure that the next time that user gets created, it gets created the proper way. Um, so that's, that's kind of the pitfall of the way we did it. Um, and we, we went back and forth because the other way you could do it would be to create an unless statement for every single grant that you're allowing a role to have. And um, we kind of started down that path and we thought this is a really hard thing to do. Not that, that we don't want to do it, but if we try to solve this right now, we're never going to get our databases built. Um, but if you could imagine um, what we would really like to do one day is generate a grant template and then a corresponding unless template so that you could verify all the grants that were in the template. And then maybe you would have like our super tight audit control of all the grants on all, all your roles. Um, maybe in like version 0.1, I don't know, we'll see. Um, this is the output of the unless statement that we were using. And like you asked, um, as long as your where clause returns something, in this case, I'm running this, this uh, query on the Postgres user, and you can see what it returns. Actually, it's kind of, that's not cut off too badly. But it returned something, because in this case, in our list of permissions, we, we do have an R in there. Um, and then sort of to wrap it all up as far as how this data flow works, um, this, is, this is how the Puppet module fans out. So we start, with, we start with our two data structures, our server to list of databases, and then our second data structure, which is our database and list of application rules. And we start here in um, master PP. We're only looking at setting up masters, because like I said earlier, slaves get anything that the master gets um, within Postgres reason, obviously. But um, we get into master. Say in this case, we had three app DBs. For each one of those app DBs, we're going to create our list of DB handles, in which case we'll fan out to three application users and all the template grants that go along with those app users. And again, here we would do the same thing for app four, five, and six on DB2. Look, I kind of messed that up, but for like DB3, you'd have app seven, eight, and nine, and those would also fan out. Um, so you can see this can pretty much go forever. Um, I, obviously, you're going to have a point where you don't want 100 databases running on a single cluster. But one of the reasons that we really um, 
like the two data structures is one of the approaches we take is we get these new apps in our environment that, you know, um, our developers, we, we run a really fast development cycle. Um, so developers will say, hey, I got this new app. It needs to be in production like tomorrow. Okay, well, we're gonna give you, we're gonna put you on like the catch-all database server because we have no idea what this app's gonna do and it could never even really make it in real life production. So, um, the flip side of that is we get an app in production that like blows up and it's like super popular and uh, you know for whatever reason gets tons of traffic. We can pair that off of a cluster, move it onto a new cluster on its own. <clears throat> Excuse me, spin up a brand new database cluster with this database. We could spin up uh, a slave in a cluster, promote it to master, rename the cluster, and then bring up three more slaves that will all replicate it. And we don't really have to do much but build servers and assign the data structures to that server. Um, and then finally, uh, dirty little secrets. Um, we had a, we do uh, these code reviews, like lunch and learn code reviews for developers, and uh, one of the developers used this, and I thought it was pretty clever because um, everyone who writes something knows all of the bad stuff that it does. Um, so one of the things that's really frustrating about Puppet is that you can't loop yet. Uh, there's versions coming out. Well, I think in the last year, we're using Puppet Enterprise, but the open source version of Puppet, the latest version, has a way to do mapping functions on hashes or arrays. Um, but we don't have that yet. So we use a custom function called prefix keys. And uh, let me see if I can go back here. Well, I can't find the slide, but basically, um, prefix keys allows you to create a unique resource name for anything that you're doing. So, um, so if you get down and dirty into this puppet running, you'll see that by the end of a, a, a user's grants being um, generated, it has this really long resource name, which is a concatenation of, you know, I'm spitballing, but you know, concatenation of like the cluster plus the database name plus the app that's connecting to it plus the user, which is really just a way for Puppet to know that it's unique and only doing one specific thing. Um, once we can use looping, we can do that a lot easier without kind of hacking in this prefix keys function. Um, and then competed.com is a, I don't really know much about the company, but they had this really awesome function, so we stole it and we put it in our, uh, put it in our stuff. Um, I figured they should get credit for that. And um, I talked about the other pitfall of the SQL grant templates and permissions and how we're really only checking that default ACL read access granted, read access is granted. So I mean that's, you know, if you're not really maintaining your systems right, you could, you could have people doing bad things behind the scenes and your puppet's not really manage, managing it. Um, and then finally, this module is highly custom. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't want other people to use it or get other people's feedback. Um, like I said, when we started, we didn't really anticipate even releasing this open source, but once we started using it and realized how powerful it was for us, we were like, we should, you know, we should go tell people about this. So um, we released it on GitHub earlier this week. It's got an MIT license. It probably won't work for you if you go use it today, um, but we respond to our GitHub accounts very quickly. And um, if anyone has any questions, put an issue in there, send us an email, um, submit pull requests, whatever you like. Um, we have a few things that we know we can pull out of there that get rid of the customizations, um, and we'll probably be doing that over the next coming, uh, next coming months. I mean, obviously, we're gonna have to maintain it for ourselves, so. We're definitely, you're gonna see pull requests on it from our team. Um, and um, it does more than that. Um, we also use it to manage our backups. We, um, that's like another customization that we have in there. Um, we use it to manage our SSL keys because all of our client connections run over SSL. Um, we use it to stand up our slaves, so we deploy our, our slave creation scripts with this Puppet module. Um, so if, 
if you go check it out, you can even see some of the other utilities that we have in there. Um, and then finally, we're using it to, uh, to trigger off schema, a schema deployment tool that we're uh, building in-house. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping we can probably come talk about that. Probably not me, but one of us can come talk about that next year because we're work, working on a, a way to deploy schemas and um, track version control of schemas within our Postgres databases. So um, it's our Swiss Army knife, and it's been working really awesome. Um, in fact, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, we, uh, we loaded a, an old backup onto a test server and completely broke our replication on one of our slaves. And um, this puppet module saved our butts because we basically just blew the slave away, rebuilt it, and it came back up and had everything it needed. It was great. Um, so that is our uh, little world of Postgres and Puppet. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes? I was just curious, kind of how, how do you guys, uh, what's the Puppet infrastructure itself? I mean, where do you run Puppet? Um, do you, this, every time you set up a new cluster, are you just building new physical servers with a new cluster on your deploying cluster for Puppet? We, um, it? it's all virtualized. Uh, so we're running everything in VMware right now. Um, and we have, uh, we have one single data center right now, and we're building a second one and a third one within the next year. So um, we'll, we'll have a Puppet Master in each data center, but we'll have the same Puppet config in every data center. And then servers will know which data center they're in. And um, um, so the, the database server itself we literally, like we have another, there's another project actually in our GitHub account called MakeVM that uses some Ruby APIs to create VMs from, uh, from Kickstarts. So basically we, we go into our higher data config, we update the data structures to list out what apps that we want to go on a cluster, or say we just create a new cluster and move it in there. So basically all we're writing is a YAML hash and then we basically run our script to create a new VM, and it boots up, runs Puppet, and it gets Postgres. So is each, is the VM one, one VM to cluster, or are you using clusters of VMs? No, we have one to one. It's, it's one cluster per VM, and then we'll have like three VMs in, in a cluster. I mean, I guess we're, we call them clusters. It's probably not the real sense of the word cluster. It's basically, we'll have, yeah, we have a, we have a master and a couple slaves. And some of them, if we have databases that aren't important, we don't even have slaves. Um, yes? Can you, can you um, on the same puppet um, in management software, can you run us, if we try to use AWS, RDS, mm -hmm. how would you um, calculate this for AWS? I have no idea. I've never used AWS. Um, so we don't use any uh, cloud servers at all, um, mainly because we deal with personal health information. So we're really gun shy about that. Um, I, so I don't know. If you'd like to, um, after this, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about it, I could and give me a little bit more information about how, how Amazon RDS works. I might be able to help you. I'd be, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Oh, in Puppet, you mean? No, we don't. Um, and for no other reason than I, I vaguely recall someone on the team saying, if you're using run stages, you might have something else wrong with your manifest. But I would say that was probably a year ago, and we've just never revisited it. I've seen other things use that and need it for certain things. Um, for example, um, I know we've had problems when we were writing this, setting SSL to true, and then not having the SSL keys there in time. So I think there's some things that might have benefited from that. Is that what you're talking about? Like doing specific things in different stages? Oh, okay, no. Um, I would say we use the hierarchy data hierarchy in, instead of that. Did you have a question? Um, so how does key management fit into this and like expiration dates and whatnot? 
for um, SSL keys? Pretty much. Any games that are on the We don't manage SSL keys. We don't manage SSL key creation through Puppet. Okay. So it doesn't fit in there at all. Um, we, we provide a few parameters, if, if I can remember correctly, we just define a few parameters that let you use whatever key you want. So um, it's not really managing expiration, but that would be pretty cool. There's an open SSL puppet module that um, someone just showed me the other week that looked really sweet. And I bet you could use that and um, use the, the resources generated from it and pass them into your... Yes? Sure. Yeah. How would you do, describe to do this in a whiteboard in YAML um, So we have the same exact problem, um, and we don't have a solution for it yet. Um, right now, as I, as I mentioned, we manually edit our high error data file, um, which I don't know how far we can go with the concept of not doing anything like manual, but we're trying it. Um, Instead of using um, Hiera data to manage the configuration, we're starting to refactor a lot of our puppet to use custom facts. So, um, so this, these data structures, in this case, again, I'm just using like a blue sky example, but in, in this case, maybe our, our data structures would be in a custom fact which is on the host and a little more dynamic. That way you're not having some script like commit to git. You know what I mean? That kind of gets funky. Um, but the short answer to your question is I don't really know. We're trying to crack that same problem. Um, and the, this DB schema deployer is one of the things we've been trying to write as, as sort of like a middleware that our applications can utilize to, um, to, to get the stuff that the apps need over to the database. So, again, I'd love to talk more about that because we're trying to crack the Docker nut as well. Everyone loves Docker, but we can't figure it out. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? All right, well, um, thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, offline, feel free to hit me up. Um, I appreciate everyone's attention. I had a good time. <laughs>